spooky friends, and welcome to another episode of the Scariest Podcast. Woo! I'm Robin Grace. This is Adam Diaz. Hello. I went a bit high on that one. <laughs> and I feel like my voice is a lot higher than it normally is, too. But uh, we're here to tell you folks, or chat together, you know, about some interesting topics. I think you told me what yours was, but why don't you give me a refresher? Uh, absolutely. I'm going to be covering uh, the Uncanny Valley this week, which I'm I've, pretty excited to do, actually. I've actually heard, I keep hearing that phrase, or, or like, you know, set of words a lot lately. Yeah, a lot of the YouTube content that I consume has referenced Uncanny Valley quite a bit recently, in fact. Um, so it's something I'm really, really excited to dig into. What are you going to be covering this week? I'm going to be covering a little tiny tidbit of Chinese New Year. A little tiny tidbit. So there's more yeah. to Chinese New Year, but there's a part of Chinese New Year that you're going to be covering. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Uh, and before we get into our topics, I just want to say that although January Patreon push is over <laughs> since it's February... Uh, it doesn't make our patrons any less important. You folks are absolutely amazing. And I really want to give a shout out to Ethan, Marissa, and Sam and Andrew for being huge supporters of our podcast. And you guys rock our socks off. Indeed. I would love to have a February Patreon <laughs> push. But I think Robin would murder me and you guys would get sick of hearing it. But sincerely, we appreciate everyone who donates. But those four individuals just go above and beyond, and we absolutely appreciate you so much for that. Um, but yeah, I believe you're going to be going first this episode, if I am not mistaken. Yeah, all right. I'll get so into just it. Uh, dive in feet first. Go for it. So welcome everyone to the beginning of February, and as with every year, this is the time when Chinese New Year, also known as Lunar New Year, I'm sure everybody hears a lot, uh, rolls around. That's usually how New Year's work. It I happens will say, every year. <laughs> this year I will miss Disney the most. Like, oh, because this is, we usually go. We usually go to Disney like once a month, and Lunar New Year there is really, really awesome, and they have I just love such food. good food there. Yeah. And this is the first year, I think, in two or three years, we won't be able to go because uh, the park's not open. Yeah. So it's uh, damn you, COVID nineteen. But yeah. Uh, type an F to pay your respects. Wow. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Um. The exact dates for Chinese New Year or Lunar New Year change every year, but it's usually around the same general time. Uh, and this is because it's based on the moon's orbit. Interesting. And yeah, so it's the moon's orbit around the Earth instead of how the Gregorian calendar is the sun's orbit around the Earth. And today I learned... So coincidental. I had, I had, they call it Lunar New Year. Yeah. I had no idea. Okay. <laughs> I always heard like, it's Lunar New Year, but I didn't ever realize like why it's called that. Um, and it, it's funny because growing up, I was always like, why is the Chinese year not on the same English year? Like, I don't understand why the dates are different. Today I learned I was 31 years old when I learned this. Okay. <laughs> I was 35. Thank you for educating me. Um, yeah. So it always falls on the second new moon after the winter solstice. So that's how the dates work. Gotcha. Um, it's nuts. It's, I mean, that's just new news, and it blew my mind when I read that, so I hope I blew a couple minds today. <laughs> so there's some knowledge and nugs for you folks. Um, it's definitely a big deal in the Chinese, in the Chinese community. Uh, I'm Vietnamese Chinese, so my family definitely celebrates this every year. I grew up celebrating it. I've done lion dancing, uh, during events with my sister and my cousins, and my friends Sandy and On. um... Have you, you haven't met on yet, but shout out to you guys. You guys are the real MVP. So you said um, lion, right? L-I-O-N, not L-I-N-E, which is what not my, my dancing, Midwestern no. ears hear. What's funny here. is because I did it in Texas too, because, <laughs> so it could have been either or, That's but funny. I've never lion danced. I've only lion danced. Gotcha. Um, what part of the animal the were, you were the ass? Yeah. Nice. And it's hard because you got to bend. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> you got to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're like a, I don't know, you got to bend over at like a 90 degree angle. And so you're just like this thing. I don't know. But as a kid, you're much more flexible. I feel like as a 31 year old person now, I couldn't do that. You say kid, but, but weren't you like 17 when you were lying? That's dancing? a kid. Okay. Back in the day. When you're 17, you're like, I'm a fucking adult. I'll do whatever I want. But now that I'm 30, I'm like, you're a fucking child. When you say when I was a kid, though, I picture you as like less than 10. You know what I mean? No, Not like okay. three years away from being 20. S no, 17. All right. I was 17. I was doing that with my cousins and my sister and a couple friends. Um, we were doing it for our temple. It, it was fun. It was a do nice they, weekend activity. Do they have any specific types of dance? Like, is it just a lion dance or do you don the costume 
and then do something. Like, if you were to say spin in circles, would they call it throwing that ass in a circle? God Because damn. you were the ass. <laughs> no. I, I honestly, like, because we were super amateur, we we did go around different uh, to different events and stuff like that because, um, I don't know, like different store openings, stuff like that we did. But really, line dancing, when we did it, was very... Um, I don't, I want to say spur of the moment. You kind of do what you do. It's like a flash mob. <laughs> it's like you just, the, the guy in the head does most of the work and you kind of just follow that person around, except when you have to do things like jumps. Yeah. Um, and, uh, or carry the person with the head on your shoulders. I never had to do that because I was basic bitch. Okay. But the people that had to carry the other person on their shoulders and stuff like that, super impressive. Um, but yeah, there's a whole bunch of different stuff and you really go along to the beat of the drum. So whoever's, whoever's like drumming is where you get most of your moves from, I guess. No, that makes sense. A lot of things in um, music follows the drums. But yeah, so that was super fun. Something I did when I was in high school. Uh, this year I've learned about Chinese legends that have to do with, um, Chinese New Year that I had no idea about. And I think it's funny that I learned it. Right around the time that Chinese New Year is going to happen this year. I think it's ironic because you did not go into your research saying, I'm going to do Chinese New Year legend. You no. went in with a very specific legend in mind and it just so happened to be attached. No, I did. I wanted to do some type of creature t- this this week. I wanted to do some type of legendary myth- mythical creature. Um, and I was just scrolling through. There's there's hundreds, okay, guys? There's so many different legendary creatures. There's not going to be a lot of information on a lot of them, obviously. But um, I came across one, and I was just like, all right, big monster does bad things. I'm going to look into it. And then as I was looking at more sources and more sites, it's like, oh, my God, this is the legend of Chinese New Year. How the fuck does that happen? It's awesome. It's nuts. I was doing something um, similar because I finished my script first. And so I was just hanging out, and I was actually going through a kaiju tournament where I would determine which kaiju would defeat the other kaiju, uh, which was super awesome because they included... Are you talking about Godzilla versus King Kong? Yeah, well, it's in honor of Godzilla versus King Kong coming up, but they have kaiju from, like, every era of Godzilla. They have the Pacific Rim kaiju in there. Wow. They even had the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. You were watching a video about that? No, I was going through the bracket and voting on who would defeat who. Oh, okay. I didn't get to the end of it. I had the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man (laughs) defeating everything it came up against. However, it had not gone up against You really uh, think the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man could... Are you fucking kidding me? It's the the chosen form of Gozer the Gozerian. Of course I do. Oh my god, okay. The stupidest question you've ever asked me. too soft. He's too soft. Wow, Robin. Just wow. Like, okay, I know you haven't put him up against Godzilla yet, but Godzilla's, like, radiation beam would fucking murder that thing. Maybe. I mean, that's pretty much exactly what did kill him. So (laughs) it's basically another radiation beam. But yeah, I think it's funny that we were both choosing big monsters at that exact same time. Nice. Yeah. Nice. All right. So Lunar New Year itself, realistically was or is a celebration of spring and was based on agricultural production for the most part. Uh, It's something that revolves around keeping track of when people need to do what. And the emperor actually had the responsibility of making sure the dates were correct. And it was so that they could tell people like, it's time to work the fields or it's time to harvest or it's time to do X, Y, Z Whatever. It's kind of like um, the Farmer's Almanac or whatever that we have out here. Right. Uh, and I thought that was pretty cool. I didn't know it. <laughs> Seriously. I don't know any of this. I'm 31. I'm... You know some of it now, though. I'm Asian, and I don't know any of this. What? So, all right. So now we're going to get into the legends about why the New Year is kind of celebrated the way it is. Uh, and I love these legends. I think they're so um, interesting because, again, my my, my mind was blown. Um, there was a beast that existed in the before four, and it was supposedly a terrifying creature that terror terrorized people, which is probably I'm mean, terror terrifying terrorized. That would make sense. Goes yeah. together, right? Um, it's most always described as a giant and monstrous beast, but its features kind of change a little bit depending on who tells the story, I guess. So sometimes it carries the features of a lion, sometimes a unicorn, and uh, at other times an ox. Uh, but when I say that, it, 
when I say unicorn, it's not like a horse with a horn. It's kind of like a more of a ferocious feline looking creature like a lion that happens to have a singular horn, probably for stabbing reasons. I don't know, but uh, definitely not a horse. So it didn't really have horse features. So it's not, not a, a unicorn. Thing. It's not really a uni. It's a lion corn. It's <laughs> no unicorn. It's because it's a uni. It has uni one yeah. horn. Yeah, got it. So so lion with corn. Lion plus corn. God, equals the lion corn. Lion stupid. corn. Wait, I said corn <laughs> instead of horn. <laughs> Oh. A lion with corn would look very different. <laughs> You're like, yeah, hey, this elote is really good. Oh my god, I love elote. Okay. So, one source that I read described this creature as having the body of a bull and the head of a lion. So, mostly lion-esque. And I'm really not here to judge. This thing can be whatever it wants to. If it wants to be an ox, it can, <laughs> you know? Um, but... People called this creature the Nian, and this is actually the Chinese word for year. And it the the Chinese character for year is the same character in Japanese for year because kanji comes from the Chinese characters. And I just thought it was so fun um, to kind of learn all these things together and be able to be like, I know that character because I can, you know what I mean? Um, there's always carry, really... there's carryover between regional languages. Yeah, and it was just so cool because the Japanese word for year is nen. And the fact that this is nen, nen, I thought it was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, there's a little language lesson for you, I guess. I'm Lots of knowledge nugs in this, this topic. This topic, seriously, I was just geeking out because it was a bunch of things uh, that it's it's kind of like, this is me in a topic, you know? Chinese, Vietnamese, Asian, Japanese, whatever. I'm Asian. All right. Um, this creature lived in the mountains and would come down at the end of the year to wreak havoc on the villagers below. So it's the end of winter. This thing's probably starving and having nothing to eat. It goes down to where there's food. So it would destroy the fields and the crops and eat their animals. Um, some stories have it where the creature would even go out of their way to eat the villagers, especially the children. It's fucked up. This thing is a monster, okay? Um, which is, it, it, when I read that, I thought it was so funny because we just got to the point in the strain today. I was gonna say, yeah. Yeah, and, and this is gonna be spoilers, so if you guys haven't watched the strain and you plan to, you can skip ahead, but this show's old, and if you haven't watched it, uh, that's on you. But we got to the point in the show where um, you finally find out why the Strigoi or the vampire people are breeding B positive, positive blood type women. And it's because they want to eat these B plus blood type babies because they're the most delicious. They basically say, yeah, B, B positive blood is the best and there's nothing better than infant B positive blood. And it's like, oh... It's not just that you're monsters, you're like you're monsters. literally monsters. We're just like, uh, I, when I saw that, I was like, what the fuck? I literally have been saying, and like, we're begrudgingly <laughs> watching the strain at this point, because I don't find it very good, but as we watch it more and more, I'm like, God, I can't wait for this show to be over. <laughs> like, I can't wait for some of these characters to finally die, so we'll see how much longer it lasts. Yeah, so, so the Nyan is just as bad as these guys by feeding on kids. Um, over time... Villagers developed defenses against the creature. In the beginning, they started just putting food in front of their doors at the beginning of each year and hoping that uh, once this thing ate enough food, it would stop attacking people. Then they found that it was actually frightened of loud noises, bright lights, and the color red. Firecrackers, right? Yeah. There's nice. a, yeah, firecrackers. Um, in order to prevent the Nyan from being a huge dick to them, they started being pretty proactive about it. And come around the time of New Year's, they would begin to hang red lanterns and red spring scrolls on windows and doors. Uh, the villagers also created, like, a big model of the creature using bamboo and paper and cloth. And within this creation of theirs, two people would walk around and act like it. And on New Year's Eve, they laid in wait for this monster to arrive. And when this creature came down from the mountains... The villagers, in their makeshift suit, accompanied the monster around. 
And they also accompanied the, this creature with the beating of drums, cymbals, and gongs, all the things that it probably hates. They also used firecrackers for more loud noises and fire, of course. And all this was in hopes of causing enough loud noise and just things that this thing hated to scare it away. Um, and it worked. After when was they the did last this? time you heard of an attack by this yeah. creature? It clearly legend, works. <laughs> legend has it that after they did this, the Nyen never terrorized them again. Maybe it was so upset with its depiction. <laughs> it was like, my chin doesn't look oh like my that. God. And then just never came you back. You hurt my feelings. Uh, it's said that the creature was eventually captured by a Taoist monk named Hongjun Laozu and made this creature their mount. So they used nice. this thing to, ra- yeah, I was like, that's a badass. Jeez, that's pretty cool. Um, again, this is all legends, right? <laughs> Who knows if this stuff was real, but if it was real, that's good on you, dude. That's cool. Um, there is a story, another story uh, about this creature that I read, w- w- it's, which is a little different. There's different details, but there is a story I read where each year the villagers would hide in their homes or pretty much just flee the village because they were afraid of this thing that was going to come down and destroy everything. And one year, an old beggar with white hair and bright eyes showed up in the town on crutches, or a crutch. Um, singular. <laughs> he didn't have two. He had one. Probably. I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, no one really paid attention to this random dude walking into town because they were dealing with their own problems, right? They're trying to pack up all their stuff, their animals, and leave. Um, all except for an old woman. This old woman lived at the east end of the village, and she offered this guy some food and advised that he should get the heck out of there because this thing was coming. And so the beggar stroked his beard, which I'm sure was luscious, <laughs> and smiled, stating, if you, allow, uh, if you allow me to stay in your home for one night, I will drive the monster out. And she obviously was like, yeah, right, sure, uh uh-huh. And so she tried to tell him, like, you should go, and he refused. So she's just like, I'm outie, and left. And by midnight, the creature came down from the mountains and arrived in the village. Except this year, things were a lot different. The old woman's home wasn't just shuttered closed. It was actually lit brightly and had red paper on the door. The creature was shocked, and was just like, what the hell is going on, and pounced on the house. But when it reached the doorstep, it heard loud cracking sounds from the inside. And the creature was too afraid to move, because loud noises. Um, the beggar had figured out that this was one of its biggest fears, and that its fears were fire, the color red, and loud cracking noises, apparently. And so the beggar opened the door wearing a red robe and just laughed at it. And this scared the creature so badly that it ran away. So, I don't know, maybe he was naked under that robe, who knows. Sounds legit. Um, (laughs) So when the villagers returned the next day, they found that the whole village was fine. And they're, they're so confused. They're like, what's going on? How is this possible? turns out that the beggar was actually an immortal who arrived for the sole purpose of driving this thing That's away. why they had the bright eyes. I was wondering when that was going to come back. Like Bright eyes. I love white, that, man. White beard. <laughs> bright eyes. Wow. <laughs> I mean, they're good. I'm, they're not he my favorite. showed up and just but... played some super sad emo oh. music. And <laughs> the just like, fuck this. So this guy gave the villagers the weapons they needed to keep this creature away. A red robe. Yeah, <laughs> no. Nudes. Nudes. Um, no, so... If it comes back, show it my dick. <laughs> so it was, uh, I mean, the color red, just make sure there's fire, the color red, bright lights, and make sure it's really loud and he'll stay away. So after this, everyone had a huge celebration and repeated this ritual year after year with it being passed down to each generation. So this is why on Chinese New Year, we celebrate with lion dancing um, and... We also do lion dancing at other big events, too, like um, like I've done at opening a new store. Or di- there's a whole bunch of different reasons why people hire lion dancing troops to come and celebrate, right? Because they want good luck. Um, 
And so that's why at Chinese New Year, there's lots of firecrackers, those big, huge stacks of Chinese firecrackers. Have you? Oh, yeah. I've seen yeah, like those the, things the are, giant strings. Right? Yeah. They're that you so, hang and you light from the bottom. So loud, so annoying, so smoky, but they're there for a reason. And uh, to drive out the lion corn. God, I hate you. It's got to be the name for so, it. No, because uni is one. I get that uni is one. It can still be lion corn or lion orn. I don't know. Your call. Whatever you want to oh, name God, it. I hate you. Okay. I'm trying to think of a cool name. I just thought of it. No. Um, but I'm watching Gundam Unicorn right now, and that's all I can think of now. <laughs> Damn it. That fucking Gundam would look a lot cooler if it was shaped like a lion. Just saying. <laughs> oh, my gosh. What is that other show that has the mecha lion? It's like... Thundercats? Is it Thundercats? No. It's not Thundercats. Voltron? Is a bull? I think it's. There's so fucking many. There of are them. a lot now. I don't know. Beats me. Chicken VR me. troopers. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is? We are VR. You never watched VR troopers? No. It was awful. How could you never watch it? Probably because it's it was just awful. like Power Rangers and all those other. Well, see, I was watching Power Rangers. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> I love the. Meme. Why would I watch the off brand if I had the on brand? I mean, it's not off. That's really rude to VR troopers. Just saying. You said it sucks. So did Power Rangers. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Power Rangers was not good. Shut up. It's like, hey, this new kid showed up. He's wearing green. Also, we keep finding a green ranger who's stomping on buildings and uh, just absolutely positively killing people. And he's like, I've had a change of heart. I'm a good guy now. And they're like, oh, cool. We'll just forgive all the deaths you caused. (laughs) No big deal. All right. That stupid fucking show. Anyway. No, the funniest part is the one guy who plays the flute through his helmet. I'm pretty sure that's the White Ranger, is who it? is the Green Ranger, and I know way too much about this, even though I hate the show. The Green Ranger, because he's using like the evil powers, eventually can't use them anymore, and he becomes the White Ranger, and I think he's the one with the God. flute. God, okay. No, 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 it's the Green Ranger with the flute. I don't know, man. I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, it's got to be the Green Ranger. I was just always like into the Pink When Ranger. you say flute, I hear Tapion from Dragon Ball Z, the 13th movie. It's a really good there's movie. There's 13 movies. Yeah, for DBZ, there's 13 movies. The 13th, that's where Trunks gets his sword from his tapion. We're way off the deep end now. <laughs> Let's go ahead and move forward. Oh my god. Anyway, so, um, it's also the reason why everything during Chinese New Year is red. So everything is red. The little envelopes that people give their kids money in and stuff like that, always red. It's such a pretty red, too. I mean, you could probably use different shades, but it's always like the brightest red possible. Right. Um, and yeah, it's just scare monsters and bad luck away. And then here's a bonus story that I thought was really creepy that I'd never heard of before, but made me chuckle at the same time. Okay. So there's another legend about the red envelopes. There's a legend that dates back to ancient times. However, relative that may be ancient times in the story could mean like, bc uh, who knows okay but you know there's actual time frames for like ancient times shut I think it's up. 2000 bc i haven't looked tell at the me about ancient aliens time. what time i hate you so that? much i think it's oh like 9 30 central <laughs> i don't know I've, I've been watching ancient aliens yeah every time she puts days. it on it's like a fuck she popped 10 benadryl i walk into the bedroom and she's just sleeping and ancient <laughs> aliens is on the tv <laughs> it's literally like sleeping pills for me putting on ancient aliens is instant sleep I enjoy it, okay? I'm not saying I don't enjoy it. It's, like, so comforting to listen to that I fall asleep. That's what I'm saying. Okay, anyway, there's a ghost that they call Sui. And this ghost has a black body and pale hands. This ghost would go around on New Year's Eve in order to hurt children. That's its main goal. And if they touch a sleeping child with their pale hands, this kid would develop a a high fever. And they'd also start talking in their sleep. And then once the fever died down, any smarts that this kid might have had diminishes and they'd become not so smart in the nicest way possible. And I just thought that was such a funny thing. Like, we don't want our kids to be dumb. We're going to have this lunch. You know what I mean? They're so scared. Of that. What's funny is when you brought that up, what I immediately thought of is like, even back in ancient times, the way people convinced other people like, hey, you should believe this bullshit story of mine is it's for the children <laughs> to save your children's <laughs> intelligence. It's like, so, 
It's just, a, it's been a pretty solid way to convince people for a very long yeah. time. So because people feared the Sui would hurt their kids, they kept their homes bright and stayed awake to protect their children. So there's a story about a couple that had a change of life baby, which means they had them when they were much older. And to protect this little miracle kid of theirs, they had their kid play with eight copper coins wrapped in red paper. And they had this kid open and rewrap these coins over and over again until they fell asleep. And they guarded this kid throughout the night. At midnight, a fierce wind shows up and the Sui came for their kid. When he tried to touch them, a bright light flashed from the forehead of this little kid and scared the ghost away. One thing that bothered me about this story is if you're protecting your kid throughout the night, why is this thing getting close enough to yeah. touch your kid? Did you fall asleep? It sounds like they fell asleep. I was annoyed. Okay. Anyway, um, after this happens, they tell everyone about the red paper and the coins, and that kind of led to the tradition. Putting money in the envelopes. So that's why now it's like a customary thing to give monetary gifts in red envelopes to kids. So they can open their third eye and drive away the demons. <laughs> yep, to scare away the demons. Uh, and it's funny because when I uh, used to go to temple, uh, back when I used to live in Texas, every Chinese New Year, they would give all the kids... These red envelopes filled with, um, they would put like $2 bills in there. So each kid would get like a $2 bill. And I think I still have my $2 bill. I'm pretty sure we ran into it when we were going through our stuff Yeah, recently. I still, I think it's in like my, it's in one of my wallets. <laughs> uh, but one of my wallets. No. <laughs> first world problems. <laughs> the first world problem was going to be which wallet it was. Anyway, so even though the roots were pretty grounded having to do with phases of the moon and agriculture and tradition it's kind of fun to have these legends as well like um i just love knowing this i did not know this before and it really is about keeping away all the bad luck and bad vibes and keeping everything gucci and just wow i hate you so much for saying that <laughs> but yeah it's 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 just trying to Start the new year with straight up luck, no bad juju or anything. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, so today I learned. Hopefully today you learned too. And hopefully you thought it's fun, especially all um, the people that celebrate Chinese New Year that might have not known any of this stuff. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed learning it. And I'm really glad we do a show like this where I can learn about stuff that I had no idea about. I feel like normally I pull up to the drive-thru and order a four-piece of McKnowledge Nugs, and I got like a 20-piece on accident, and it was just this delightful, delightful, happy accident. Well, technically, you just poured all those Knowledge Nugs in my mouth, so uh, good stuff, Robin. I really appreciated that. So You're welcome. Thanks. All right. So before we move into my topic, we are going to take a quick commercial break. And we are back. So this week, I really wanted to dig into some type of human mystery, not necessarily a cryptid or a possession. And we've recently had an influx of suggestions for topics. We've been getting them mainly through the Discord channel, which is awesome. And we both recently had a slew of ideas for topics. Uh, a little like peek behind the curtain. We have a Google Doc that Robin and I share uh, that has like it's split down the middle. So there's two I columns. I started putting stuff on your side. Yeah, and she usually has more than I do, but some of her topics are fairly short. Cause I try and steal them sometimes. I'm like, ah, there's only like one page about this. I can't make this a fucking topic. But she's like started to spill over into my side, which has gotten relatively used up because I've been going through my backlog of stuff, and now our document is like full. So I had one on there that when I tossed it on there, I told myself it's not going to last long. This one is really weird, and it's definitely very sciencey. So if you're not into the science thing, I will say hang on because there is some really fun, creepy shit at the end. The entire topic, in fact, is really creepy. It's kind of deep. It's a little bit existential, which is like the is worst it kind also of dread. Extraterrestrial? No. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of disturbing, which I really enjoy. So. I'm excited to dive into this. We're going to start on the science side of things. We're going to go explanation of what it is, a science hypothesis of where it could be coming from, and then we're going to get on the wild side of things near All the right. end. So strap on, folks. Without further ado, I present to you the Uncanny Valley. 
For those of you who might not know what the Uncanny Valley is, allow me to explain. Uncanny Valley is a term used to describe a feeling of unease or feeling unsettled that a human being feels when they're viewing a visual and sometimes audio simulation of a human being. It's almost primarily focused on uh, visual. So one of the most common examples of this is animation, especially in 3D animations. So not just like cartoons, but like most animated feature films since like 1995. Not necessarily all of them, but some of them, and we will get to that. Before I go even further, I do want to note that Toy Story is often credited as the first 3D animated film, and that's not true. It is not. Uh, Technically, it was a short called Luxo Jr., L-U-X-O Jr. Is it also a Pixar thing? It's just over two minutes long. It was created by Pixar, and it's a video of a lamp shining down on a little ball, and the lamp is, like, anthropomorphic, so it can move its, like, head around and view stuff. And then a little lamp comes out of nowhere and starts playing with the ball. It was actually made by Pixar in 1986. Wow. It was a long time ago. It's like a test. And it looks great. You know, it took them four months to make basically a minute and 40 of this video. But if you watch it, you're like, this looks fucking awesome for 1986. Considering what video games looked like back then, it looked fantastic. And when they showed it off, people absolutely loved it. So it's not shocking that their old Pixar logo, which was just a piece of shit, got replaced and they used the lamp from Luxo Jr. So that's where the lamp in the Pixar uh, logo came from. So fun stuff. And we're going to get back yeah, into so many knowledge nuggets. This dropping episode. No- we're just dropping knowledge nuggets all over. You guys ordered a fucking 40 piece. You didn't even realize it. <laughs> so getting back into Can Uncanny Valley. Fuck. Oh, God. Could I? 20 Can minutes. Can you really? Oh, yeah. Two, two fucking nugs of men. Guarantee you I would get through that. Shut and if up. It's, I'm talking McDonald's. If you're talking Chick-fil-A, ah, I could probably do 60. No. Oh, yeah. I could do 60. This is so. I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm trying to be healthier, but I could. So anyways. <laughs> The Uncanny Valley Hypothesis originally showed up in 1970, and it originated from someone named Masahiro Mori. And this is what he proposed. Sounds Japanese. I I believe he is Japanese. This is what he proposed, and this was in relation to robots at the time, when artificial intelligence was really starting to be developed. It was more like programs were starting to be put into machinery that were taking away jobs like on assembly lines and things like that in factories. And the more people started to think about the practical applications of robotics, the more they started thinking we should make robots look like people. Oof. And that's when the Uncanny Valley thing came up. It's a bad idea. So basically, this is what it breaks down to. As the appearance of a robot is made more human, some observers' emotional response to the robot becomes increasingly positive and empathetic. That is what was assumed and for the most part had happened. But... At some point, they realized that wasn't always going to be the case. And the theory or the hypothesis, I should say, goes on to say it reaches a point in which the response quickly becomes strong revulsion. You're revolted. Like, think of the last time you saw something you say, like, this is revolting. Did AI, the movie AI, have any of those vibes at all? I don't remember because I fell asleep. Oh, okay. <laughs> so fucking boring. <laughs> so, oh, I woke up watching AI at one point, and they're like in the future, and it was like they're That's in, a Will Smith movie. They're right? in like ice. No, AI is a fucking Jude Law movie, oh. and it had the kid who sees dead people. You're thinking of I Robot. I Robot, which is an Isaac Asimov short story, not called I Robot. I don't think that they basically. Which is the one where the robot kills somebody? Well, neither. I don't know. I don't know what happens in AI, but. Oh, God. I don't know. I, robot, they think a robot killed someone. It's oh, okay. really, it's not, okay. I'm not going to spoil anything for anyone, but let me just keep going with this theory, okay? <laughs> you hit a certain point with making a robot look more and more human, and the more human it looks, it's like, it looks great, it looks great, it looks great, and the closer you get to it actually looking human, people are like, this is fucking disgusting. And they didn't understand why it would happen, but it's also stated in this hypothesis of the official Uncanny Valley that there can be a point where it is so close to human that the emotional response flips back to be positive once again when it's basically so close to human you can actually develop human-to-human empathy levels for a machine. That's terrifying. But think about when you watch movies where humans are literally represented by actors and then all of a sudden you think, oh my god, like how could you treat like Arnold Schwarzenegger in Terminator 2? Like, I don't know who the fuck you are, but if you haven't seen Terminator 2 yet, you've wasted your life. (laughs) 
<laughs> and when that fucking dude gets Adam lowered, loves Terminator when that dude, dude gets lowered oh, down yeah. into the molten steel or whatever it is at the end of the movie, I oh. fucking cry every single Shut time. Shut up. Because you just love him by the end of that movie. Okay, I admit I cry at everything, so but I'm not going to judge you. Here's the thing, though. We're talking about a movie where an actor plays a robot, or an android, cyborg, whatever. Don't fucking at me. I don't care. But it's an actor. They don't make him up to look too perfect. I mean, you know? when they rip his face off, he looks like a robot. But he doesn't look more human that way. You know what I'm saying? Okay. He's just human. It's just Arnold Schwarzenegger looking all fucking bulked up and then being like, all right, he's a robot and go. But if you're making a robot <laughs> and you're putting latex and all fi- like fake shit all over him to try and make him more human. They have that plasticky look to them. You will trigger the Uncanny Valley effect. So, now that we know what it is, we understand that Uncanny Valley is basically this area of repulsive response aroused by a robot or a depiction of a human being in film or art or animation or whatever. So, it's basically between barely human and fully human. You can hit the Uncanny Valley. What about Alita Battle Angel? How do you feel about that one? I haven't seen it. The eyes are too big, though. She is creepy looking. The eyes are specifically too big to make it look less human. I fucking guarantee it. Really? I 100% guarantee you that is an art decision huh. to not trigger the Uncanny Valley. Because, right. I mean, like, we're going to get into stuff a little bit later, so I'm not going to spoil it. So, well, let's just keep moving. Okay. So, it's interesting because throughout human history, we haven't really quantified this behavior until recently. Like, 1970 is when this theory popped up. But that does not mean that this reaction hasn't been present within human beings before we started making robots or animations that depict us All right. that creep us out. So if you're hearing this and thinking, all right, I hear what you're saying. I understand what this is, but I don't think this has ever happened to me. I'm going to go ahead and say you're probably wrong. Because really? one of the most common reactions, and I've seen a lot of you folks post in our social media, <laughs> one of the most common reactions that is the Uncanny Valley is seen in human beings not when they view cartoons or movies or robots. It's when they look at a lifelike doll. Porcelain dolls are scary, though. Yeah, and that's the thing. You say that, but why? Because they look like they wake up in the middle of the night and shank you in your sleep. It triggers a response from you that makes you think you're threatened. Like, dolls are typically just a depiction of a human being, and you know they're created by a human being. But people don't look at a Barbie doll or a G.I. Joe and feel disturbed. No, because G.I. Joe is going to save my life. Yeah. He's there to help you. And Barbie's <laughs> there to ruin girls' images of themselves because she's Oh, dude. Have you terrible. seen that video of, like, if you took Barbie's proportions and made her a life-size human being, she's a giant. And now that you say that, you realize that those are not accurate depictions of a human being. Huh. That's why you're not disturbed by them. So, and honestly, if you want to say, like, whether or not G.I. Joe or Barbie triggers that, you can just look at the sales numbers and say, well, obviously they don't. They're, like, the best-selling toys of all time. But when it comes to things that are lifelike, like, I don't know, porcelain dolls, but, people okay. tend to have a very different reaction. They design them strangely, though. Why would you put it where the eyes flutter when they move? To make it more human-like. It's terrifying. The more things you do to make something more human-like that is not human, the more it triggers Uncanny Valley. I think it's very interesting because you can still see this in movies. Like, when I say Annabelle, you picture the doll Annabelle, right? Yeah. That was a Raggedy Ann doll. Yeah. It was not the doll that we see, but when they made the movie, they're like, how do we make this more unsettling? Make her look more human. Make her look more human. And that's what they did, because they know, they know now what Uncanny Valley is and the reaction that it's going to have with people. There's a woman who makes, like, uh, babies out of silicone, and they look so realistic, and it freaks people out. Yeah. Because they look exactly like babies. You don't want to see, you don't want to see a human being imitated so well. And it triggers this response from you. And that's what this whole topic is about and why I find it so fascinating. Like, the entire idea behind so many horror shorts or books or movies are how fucking creepy and lifelike dolls are. Mm -mm. But why would you want to make something more creepy and lifelike? It's just a more detailed depiction of a human being. Why is something that is more proportionally accurate where you're not going to be a giant haunting woman... Like you would be if Barbie was actually a real human being. She's like seven feet tall or something. Why does make, making them more accurate, more detailed, creepier than a small plastic figure with pointy tits and a tiny waist? No one likes that, but it doesn't make you feel uncomfortable. No one likes that or no one looks like that. No one looks like that either. And that's why you're not uncomfortable about it. And that is why, according to this Uncanny Valley hypothesis, we get triggered. Lifelike dolls are just too lifelike. Less lifelike is always better. Or super lifelike would be best because then you might think this is something real. That's a child, you know? Pinocchio 
becomes a real boy. You know what I mean? He's a real boy. And then you can identify with him. But if he like just got carved better and better and made to look almost real, people would be like, burn it! <laughs> like, it's going to be different reaction depending <laughs> well, on how like, it looks. Uh, like the Bratz dolls. Those are some of the most popular dolls that people buy for their kids. I don't even and know they, those are. Oh my gosh, you're missing out. You're I gonna kids. Watch when you have daughters. Or we're going to have way too many. <sighs> oh but where porcelain dolls and things like that typically sit is just too much for people to feel comfortable around. But not everyone. Like, some people are weird and collect those dolls to each their own. I'm not going to judge you for that. I know I called you weird, but I'm fucking weird too. So I just talked about Dragon Ball Z like 20 minutes ago. It's like I can't get through a single episode without bringing it up. <laughs> you have an obsession. I do. But that brings me to my second example. When you think of animated films, they typically just fucking crush the box office when they come out. If there's a new movie coming out from Pixar or DreamWorks or Disney or who the fuck ever... They usually dominate, like Toy Story, Frozen, How to Train Your Dragon, Kung Fu Panda. But their eyes are giant. That's the thing. Some of them might bomb, despite solid scripts and great voice acting and casts and things like that. And you're like, I wonder why that happened. They're few and far between. It doesn't happen all the time. But they never depict everything super lifelike. Like, Toy Story is an animated depiction of, of toys, toys, which are already not lifelike. What about movies like Final Fantasy VII Advent Children? What's so funny is Final Fantasy Spirit Rock. What's the one they came out with with Alec Baldwin was one of the voice the, actors? I think it's uh, Spirit. Spirit Within? Within. No, yeah. Something like that. But it, that I do not remember that movie because I don't remember it being very good. James Woods was the bad guy. I remember that. It wasn't very good. But it had reviews that weren't talking about the story. It talked about how fucking creepy the characters were. Really? Looked. Absolutely. So a good example of movies that were supposed to be a surefire hit that weren't are things like Polar Express. Now, Polar Express did very well, okay? In the grand scheme of things, it made its money back, it made profit, but they projected that movie to basically go about four times above what the budget was, and it barely cleared It barely cleared two times what the budget was. I've never seen that movie. I've never seen it either. I have heard things about it where people are like, I don't like it, I don't know why, I can't explain it. But when the reviews came out, they talked about the movie being great, it's this thing for children, but a lot of folks talked about the fact that the animation style and the characters were creepy and the characters seemed, quote, dead-eyed. I found four different reviews Shut from up. when that movie came out where they said the characters looked like they had dead eyes. And if you just go Google it and look at the movie, it's like it's not like they're beady eyes like a teddy bear or a shark. It just has accurate proportions and they had this new CG where they were trying to make things look photorealistic. And so people found Polar Express disturbing. And this cropped back up again with another animated movie, A Christmas Carol. How hard is it to take Charles Dickens' classic, A Christmas Carol, release it during Christmas time... The one with Jim Carrey? ...and slap Jim Carrey as Scrooge and not have it do well? The movie did make its budget back, again. But again, it missed projections. This that time, this budget was $200 million. They made back $300 million worldwide. It didn't even make back its budget domestically. But I like that movie. Okay, cool. I'm glad you like I mean, that movie. But what's wrong with it? So you've seen the one with Ebenezer Scrooge is Jim Carrey, yeah. correct? So when that one came out, they started talking about how as CG develops, things start to become more disturbing because motion capture is trying to make these people look like cartoons who look exactly like people rather than cartoons. Okay, so what about video games um, that use motion capture like Grand Theft Auto now and all that stuff? It hasn't gotten to the point where you can have in a video game with the limited capacity that all the systems have mm -hmm. something so photorealistic where it triggers uncanny valley okay at no point when you play most video games do you think man that looks just like real life it very rarely ever happens when people say that it does it's usually on a commercial or they're full of shit <laughs> unless it's like forza and that's a car and you don't get triggered by photorealism in a car so christmas carol came out the the Forza. margin for how much money it made <laughs> narrowed again, and you had some of the same reviews come out saying it's this retelling, blah, 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 blah. Characters don't seem lifelike. Characters seem too lifelike. People were getting creeped out by it. And then when this really triggered off and they realized this was something that was costing them money was the movie Mars Needs Moms. I remember seeing commercials for this fucking everywhere. Mars it was being Mars. put out by Disney. It was directed and written by Simon Wells. If you don't know who Simon Wells is, he directed Five Will Goes West, 
Balto. Oh, I love all those. Prince of Egypt. <gasps> he directed the live action Time Machine movie with Guy Pierce, which is a wonderful fucking movie and a great book. If you've never read it, you should. Simon Wells is also the great grandson of H.G. Wells. Shut up. So like this dude knows what he's doing and he knows how to make movies. And they put $150 million into making this movie, okay? Disney released it expecting to print money, like normal, I've never with heard of animated it. movies. Most people haven't heard of it. Lifetime worldwide gross, $39 million. It's one of the biggest box office bombs of the 2000s. It was huge. And they were so pissed because they released it and, like, no one wanted to see it. And what they kept hearing in reviews, I found six different sites from launch week, where it made less than seven million dollars, where Do you people have the said, picture or something that I can look at." I don't sure, know. and people said like the characters are just too creepy, and like some people are like, "Oh, the story's too cheesy," blah 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 blah, and they keep bringing back up like, "I don't like the animation. The animation style throws me off. I feel uneasy, and it just keeps coming up." But is it is it because it's creepy, or is it because it's just not the Disney style? Well, that's the thing. The Disney style is very specific. Yeah. And this very specific Disney style is not photorealistic. Yeah. These are photorealistic. It's like car- it's like 3D cartoons. These are live action people being filmed doing things and then basically layering as realistic of animation over them as you possibly can. Okay. And this is and we're going to get into who's doing this. This looks awful. It looks awful. But these characters proportionally are more accurate than any other Disney film that goes out. Yeah. And people fucking hated it. Like you just said, just looking at it, this is awful. So what's super interesting about this whole thing, about these three movies and how they kept triggering people until they got to the point where, by the way, this was the end of the studio who made this. So <gasps> wow. these three movies all came from Image Movers, which was a production company that was started by Robert Zemeckis. If you don't know who Robert Zemeckis is, Back to the Future, 1, 2, and 3, Forrest Gump, Death Becomes Her, Castaway, he did all of those. He basically just made a bunch of money, started his own company to basically compete with Pixar. And it died. They made things too photorealistic, and it died because of that. And at that point, they're like, stop making things photorealistic. Exaggerate the features, make them look more like cartoons. Because even though they have this all-star cast and this movie and this director, no one wanted to see this fucking movie. Like, just the previews, people are like, I don't think it looks good. I don't know why. It's like, okay... What makes sense about a movie where you train a dragon? Okay, bad example. Dragons are fucking sweet. But, like, what makes sense about any other Disney movie? When the plots come out and they get released, you're like, that just sounds like a cartoon. That sounds like a silly movie. amazing. I love that movie. That's what got me back into watching animated movies. That movie's wonderful. It's a fucking masterpiece. It's a work of art. (laughs) But Mars Needs Moms did not do well. It looks bad. It completely changed everything. But that's the thing. You say it looks bad. But those characters are proportionally accurate. And you can find posts on the internet right now that will take a character like Elsa or Anna or Anna, whatever. And give her, like, more and realistic. And make them more realistically proportional. And people fucking hate it. They get so annoyed about it. And then they try and defend, like, they do already look realistic. It's like, no, they really don't. The particular brand of CG trying to generate and replicate what people actually look like but make them cartoons just bothered people so they deliberately dialed it back and you know what happens when they try and make things look 100 percent human not human with cartoon layered over it but human tried to make look better or different go watch rogue one and see when carrie fisher shows up on screen or peter cushing shows up on screen or, well i mean even in okay wait maybe i don't want to give the mando spoilers I was going to say, but... uh... When it happens again in The Mandalorian, it's like, everything we have right now can create a CG recreation of a human being. And when they decide, like, let's try and make it as perfect as possible where you think it's the actor. Like, deepfake is the next technology that's different. It's not CG. It's a completely different thing. And it's also horrifying. It is horrifying. I will totally do a topic on deepfake because that is going to be the future of propaganda in the world. And it's the most terrifying thing you could ever imagine. (laughs) But no, when they tried to do that for these characters, they, they basically wrote a blank check. Disney wrote a blank check, like make this look like Carrie Fisher. Carrie Fisher's like, it's a person that stood there that acted and they took everything about them and they just changed their face to try and make them look like a character. Carrie Fisher standing was her fucking daughter. What? Yeah, because she looked the most like her mom, and she just said one line, and everyone was still like, it looked awful. And it's like, that's the best it will ever look. 
It's like, it might get better to the point where it will just basically be that person standing there. And that's when you'll finally drop out, or I should say, come out of the uncanny valley. And most people think like, I just don't like bad CG. It's like, that's not bad CG, you know? It's just not perfect. It's just too close to perfect without being perfect. And that's what triggers it. So why does this happen? That's a complicated question. Well, it's like, okay, it's not a complicated question. It's a complicated answer. So there's a ton of theories. Most of them involve what part of the unconscious human mind is being triggered by a false representation of a human being. The first one I'm going to cover, because I'm not going to cover all these. You can look them up if you want. But the first one I'm going to cover, to me, is feasible in my mind. It's called the mate selection theory. Hmm. And to break this down as basic as I can, human beings have a passive ability That allows them to see traits in other human beings that make them think, hey, that person would be a good mate. Now, I think the best example at a surface level of this, and this isn't subconscious, is more conscious. Is that why I'm super into Chris Evans? Mm. (laughs) I don't know. Why are you super into Chris Evans aside from the fact that he's crazy hot? No, it's when, it's when, like, my friends and I growing up had different tastes in women. Like, we're heterosexual males, but for some reason, like, some chick would walk by and they'd be like, dang, that girl's fine. And they had huge tits and flat asses. And I was always like, I don't think she's that hot. I was a big fan of asses. And I was like the only guy like that. I don't know why. It's not like I made a conscious choice to say, like, I'm an ass man. Like, I just was. I just just am. You're just an asshole. It just works for me. Fuck you, dude. (laughs) But there's nothing wrong with big boobs. They're just, they're fantastic, too. But my unconscious brain sees a lower back connecting in a straight line to thighs. (laughs) God. And it doesn't All interpret the girls that. All out there that have butts like that are probably like, fuck you. Well, it just, my brain never interpreted that as that's a potential mate. But like all my friends were like, I don't care about that. And it's like, it's a subconscious thing where that's just sort of how you like locate a mate. And humans have the passive ability to perceive things, whether accurately or not, that trigger them in some way, shape or form, whether to be attracted to or driven away from like, If for whatever reason, something about the person makes you think they have things like low fertility or poor hormonal health or ineffective immune systems, those things can trigger an avoidance mechanism. And those have studies that have been done at the highest level where they just have people interview with each other to see whether or not they find them as a potential mate consciously. And when they ask them why, they're not sure. Like and they it, monitor it, a bunch of different various things that could potentially drive someone away if they knew it. It's like imprinting from Twilight. I hate you so fucking much, dude. <laughs> so this is according to science. I have no idea how it works. I'm not a scientist. Don't ask me. Don't at me. You can read up on these theories yourself. But in this theory, it basically states that seeing an artificial representation of a human triggers this passive trait and basically sets off all the warning signals at once. Basically, all those things that you're interpreting and you cannot explain why. All you know is you hate it. Run away from it. It's not a good mate. There's something wrong with it. And by pulling back and making these characters less lifelike, you avoid the trigger. And that, to me, is evident in how many grown men I know today that have never once complained about unrealistic proportions of, like, Pixar moms, but are huge fans of the fact that they're all equipped with absolute dump truck asses. (laughs) Dump truck asses? What the fuck does that even mean? It's a meme that's going around right now. I've literally had it sent to me by no fewer than three of my friends in the past 30 days. And they're like, oh, goddamn, Pixar moms are so hot. Are they talking about Elastigirl? Elastigirl, and there's, like, two other ones. And, like, I'll show you the meme after this. God. So, okay, the next thing we're going to touch on is called <laughs> mortality salience. And this one's pretty pretty weird. So, seeing something in the uncanny range brings about the fear of death is what this one basically states. So, somehow, by seeing a robot or a, a realistic depiction of a human, it triggers your fear of death, which for most people is dormant. You don't really think about it unless you have some sort of life-changing event or tragic event, in which case it brings it to the forefront. And the fear of death at its core is a very triggering human experience. Like, confronting and learning to deal with the concept of death is one of the most difficult and fearful things a human being can do. And they typically do it throughout the course of their life in various stages. So, having this brought to the forefront of your mind, but subconsciously, by just viewing something, is definitely triggering. And it definitely makes you evoke a reaction of, I hate that thing. I don't want to see it. The other thing this particular theory says is triggered out of someone is thinking subconsciously that there's another fear that is brought forth, which is replacement, that this thing is here to replace me. And 
the replacement fear is something where when people get older, they tend to, quote, fear change more. Okay. Because as you grow up, we identify more and more with things that are around us at that time. So music and movies and technology and food, basically whatever encapsulates your snapshot of culture. Those things are yours. And when those things change, as they naturally do, we feel as though those things changing our culture and by proxy we are being replaced. So you're into music and it's not popular anymore. You know, you're into a TV show or movies and all of a sudden no one wants to watch those or your music gets put on an oldie station. You're like, what the fuck is happening? I don't like anything that's on the regular stations anymore. Yeah. I have to start listening to the oldie stations. You just feel replaced. Which not that's to trigger when you just anyone. Get Amazon Prime or like Spotify or something. You're like, nope. Make that's my when own you playlist. just shift into the mode where you just keep listening to the same stuff you listened to yeah, in college or in high me. school. <laughs> so I'm not trying to trigger anyone, but that's just how things naturally happen. And if you feel like you're being replaced, it's kind of because you are by that perspective. And you can either change with the times if you want to stay current, or decide like you're just going to listen to your eight track player for the rest of your life because that was the pinnacle of technology. And the rest of us are just going to say, okay, boomer. Well, or whatever the I mean, new thing's going to be for millennials when we're the 50-year-olds. I would still buy vinyl records. See? See what I'm talking about? I would. I mean, I think they're cool. But in this theory, seeing a representation of a human being that approaches reality triggers this fear of replacement, which, as we can all discuss, fearing being replaced is something very real, even if you don't think about it very often. And seeing something out of a robotics facility or on television triggering that is bizarre. And that's why the Uncanny Valley is so weird. These things can trigger... Basically, from any depiction of a human being, but seeing a 3D and tangible representation, according to this theory, is the most frightening thing. And that's why people reject realistic looking robots. And that's why, basically, you should never follow that road of, like, Terminator or AI (laughs) or iRobot or any of that shit. Because people will develop, basically, a prejudice against robots, despite the fact that they're not sentient. And then when people realized this was a thing, people started writing science fiction novels about that prejudice against sentient robots where it's like well what if they could think and feel yeah and they thought like this is this really rich well that we can write science fiction about and the more people read it the more they're like okay this is fucking haunting and terrifying and i hope it never happens so the last sciencey one i will mention is called conflicting perceptual cues this one has a ton of studies done like i found like 17 references on this and it's basically the basic breakdown of this one is when you examine a face of an artificial human we simultaneously categorize features that are fundamental opposites. And what is meant by that is imagine if you looked at someone that's brand new when you met them and you wrote down the features of this person to I remember them. I almost will never remember your name. So, but imagine writing down like <laughs> eyes are brown, hair is black, nose thin, chin is strong. But imagine as you're doing that, all of a sudden you have two notepads and one of them you have to list the fake features. Fake Where it's features. like, well, that's the one that made me think this isn't a real human being. And basically, when you see something that's almost real, like a depiction of, I don't know, moms or Marjanese moms or whatever, as you're looking at something, the reason that you hate it is because as you're categorizing like this person in your brain, which your brain does automatically, even if you don't remember it, like if you forget someone's eye color or their name or whatever, but as they're categorizing it, some of those are being categorized as that's not real, like simultaneously. So while you're doing this categorization, you have this cognitive dissonance of, You're uncomfortable because some of these things are reminding you what you're looking at is not a human. And you don't do that when you know something's not a human. Like if you watch Frozen, you're never looking at that saying like, that's an actual human being because there's enough. It's because a lot of the features are exaggerated. Because the features are exaggerated enough where you can just take it in and realize this isn't real. But the closer you approach to real, you start to separate things where it's like, that's real, that's real, that's real, that's not, that's not, that's not. But they all identify with the same thing. And that cognitive dissonance is what bothers people. So I know a lot of these are really weird, and you're like, you're getting really into the science part of why I hate robots and why all these other things might make me feel uncomfortable. So let me get into one that's just, like, really at the core of humanity that I find really fucked up. Is this the one where it's like we wiped out a whole other... Why do you want to spoil my topic, Robin? So This is the one that I've heard of before that freaks me out. Okay, so 300,000 years ago, There are thought by studies that have been done and artifacts that have been found and things that have been unearthed to have been at least nine different species of human beings, what we consider human beings, walking around the face of the earth. 
And the number does change. There are some subspecies. I found a different thing that took the nine and broke them down into different subspecies. So there could be even more depending on what article you read. It is widely believed that these species, when they came into contact with another, not with their own, but with another, would kill the other. It would immediately trigger a reaction where they would be interpreted as an enemy. So the best way I can represent that is, is basically anytime you see something that looks different than you, you interpret it as an enemy. If you're around things that all look like you, you just notice something right away as they're too short, they're too tall, they're too hairy, they have too defined of a brow. And those are the things that would trigger these species of human beings to basically kill each other. One of the topics I fully intend to cover are mass extinctions. It's actually on my list right now. And because there have been several in the planet's history, they're all different and they're all fascinating and they're all terrifying. The sixth mass extinction in the planet's history coincides with the arrival of a species known as Homo sapiens. If you don't know, that's what we are. (laughs) That's what human beings now are. So between 300,000 and 10,000 years ago, in that 290,000 year range, the eight other species of humans were wiped from the face of existence off the planet. And we do know the fact that they would just war with each other anytime they were nearby or saw each other. They developed tools and instruments for writing and civilizations. And then they basically would destroy each other if they ever got near each other, which should sound familiar because that's pretty much how things have gone throughout the entire extent of human history. Except we typically do it now for land or resources and not so much as they look different than me. Although that is basically what racism is in case you didn't know. 100 So, I hate you with that one other thing. (laughs) So, there are a lot of theories on this. And not all of them treat, and barely any of them, in fact, treat what happened like World War Human. It wasn't like these nine tribes all went off against each other. It's more like anytime they bumped into each other, they would basically wipe each other out in that area. But it's most likely that some massive change to the planet's temperature killed off the other eight species of uh, human beings. And Homo sapiens were just the species that was best equipped to deal with whatever environmental change had happened. And that's why they are the ones that survived. And then they spread. They procreated across the globe. And that's basically how humans took over the world. The idea that humans see another quote-unquote human that is slightly different in just the slightest dimensions or proportions or defined or not defined feature triggering this effect is very heavily related to basically where we all came from, and it's still there. We just have the sentience now where we can interpret these things, and when something like that that's so strong, this feeling of repulsion, uh, shows up, you're like, what the hell is happening and why do I feel this way? So most likely seeing something that is perceived as human but not quite is triggering that dormant instinct in this theory And that is identified by literally all of those theories, that there's this something in us that just gets triggered when we see these things, right? There's this particular thread on the internet that was on Tumblr that talks about Uncanny Valley and proportions and how things are different. And it's just a picture of a wolf. And it's like like child wolf. I don't know what you call it, pup. And (laughs) they basically made the eyes really big and the nose and mouth really big. And they said, this is what this picture would look like if it was a Pixar movie. So it started the debate of whether or not proportions were actually misaligned and blah, 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 blah. So as that went on, people started talking about Uncanny Valley and where it could come from. And someone made this statement, which really freaked people out. And they said, what was out there that mimicked humans so well and was so dangerous to us that we evolved to have this as a tactic for survival? It's most likely the eight other species of humans. And that just was sort of drilled into us for 290,000 years. Or extraterrestrial race no not at all (laughs) so one tumblr user named simon alkenmayer which is an alias which they stated was an alias made some comments that drew attention to themselves when they started referring to humans as if they were not one so someone's on this tumblr thread and they're just like humans are fascinating to me and you immediately think like this person's full of shit and when someone tries to question them on it they're like just check out my blog which is just shameless self-promoting so I went to this blog and this website that details this experiment they're running. And in this introduction, they state that they are not human. They are a, quote, very old anthropophagic cryptid, which basically means they're a really old monster. And they say they prefer the term monster, but they're okay with cryptid. 
They have a timeline for their life from when they can remember things beginning, but they knew they existed before that. They basically state they're like 650 years old. And they give all these detailed descriptions of all these events they've witnessed throughout history and how they basically just hidden and pretended to be a human because they can look enough like a human they can get away with it. They talked about how when religions used to drive people to cover up their skin and have more modesty, it was much easier to hide. But the more time that's gone by and the more that people feel less sheltered and less likely to restrict things, that most of the monsters have sought out different areas where the religions still make you basically hide your skin or hide your oh face. Oh my gosh. And that this person just doesn't feel like doing that. I shouldn't say person. This monster just doesn't feel like doing that. So it's almost certainly bullshit. Don't get me wrong. But what they if do it's make not? a very concerted effort to point out that humans have surrounded themselves, especially in the last century, with so much fiction about every type of creature we've ever seen or think we've seen that we have some sort of legend or lore about, or just a general harsh reality that we don't want to face, we write so much fiction about it, whether it's through literature or uh, radio programs before or movies or television now, that we have literally cognitively programmed ourselves to identify these scary things like monsters as fiction immediately. If you confront something... And basically, we programmed ourselves to be so skeptic, we can't believe in anything supernatural or anything different than what we're used to seeing. And I think that part holds a lot of water. I talk about that all the time, that people that are absolutely certain that what they saw, despite the fact they have no proof that it was normal, just are as ignorant as anyone who immediately believes something like, oh, something moved, it must be a ghost. Like, it's two sides of the spectrum. And this person points out that because human beings have done this, they've made it a lot easier to hide amongst them because they literally started a blog to tell people I'm a monster to conduct this experiment to see if anyone at all would believe them. And they told people, I don't want to answer questions twice, but any question you ask me, I'll put on my FAQ. This FAQ on their fucking website is so fucking long. And people basically just ask any question that comes to mind. Like how old are you? How old are you? Where did you come from? Do you have a gender? Are there others like you? Stuff like that. And There's a lot an of these, imposter among us. A lot of these answers are really detailed and well thought out. One of the questions that I really got triggered on where I was like, this is horseshit, is someone asked how many languages they know. And they stated they know quite a bit. They said one of the first languages that they learned was Latin, even though it was a dead language already. And I was like, well, if you know it's a dead language already, why would you learn it? No one was speaking it. No one was writing it when you supposedly like came into existence. Was it a dead language 600 years ago? Well, it was still being used, but no one was speaking it actively. Like when they say dead language, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist anymore. Like I just said the word Latin. Obviously, it still exists in human consciousness, but no one actively practices it in their like region. They don't speak it and they don't write it. It's not like the preferred language of any region on Earth. So they go on to state that they know all these other dead languages as well. And then they bring up all these languages they do know. Some of them like are really obscure and some of them are like Italian. And then they state like, but don't ask me to write it. I can't do that. Like English is the one that I know because I've hung around people that speak English the longest. So I was like, that seems like a shitty excuse to not want people to point out that your grammatical errors are terrible because you're using Google Translate. But who knows? Maybe they really didn't like, I don't know if I was 600 years old, if I would have learned any new languages. And if I did, would I, I write would it? I have 100, 100%. I, I knew you were going to say 100 again. But I don't know if I would write it. I would definitely speak it so I knew what people were saying. Um, they've actually published a book on this, which is not shocking no, because it's gotten a lot not. of attention on their experiment. Uh, it costs like 40 bucks. I think it's like $36 plus shipping. I will say, if you want to run an experiment, and one of the FAQ things is like, how do you get by? And they basically stated that because they're 600 years old and they've had savings accounts, they've had proper investments their entire existence yeah, they invested in, in the human world that I hate you so much that they have all this amassed wealth. And I'm like, if you have all this fucking money and you're running an experiment to see how many people that you can get in on this, why why are you charging $40 for your fucking book? Like that makes no sense. Like charge less or give it away for free. But I think it's absolutely fascinating that by depicting ourselves in technology and media, we've tapped into this passive reaction that we still don't completely understand. And the more you really think about this, especially if you think about like the world war human angle the more you begin to wonder if like a bipedal cryptid, like a Sasquatch or a Yeti or something that resembles a human being or so on are really just outliers of a previous now extinct human species like Neanderthals that were a mutation 
or they just survived because they were slightly different and the rest of their species was wiped out and they've just somehow managed to stay alive because there's enough of them. When it comes to that, I still don't know how they would hide so well. But when you look back and see how different people are, like there's a region in Asia where it's called like deer people, like red deer people because of like all the hair they had on their faces and like the way their appendages work and how they think they're able to jump really high. And I'm like, this is super fucking creepy. But they've realized like these people existed. These things existed. So you're like skunk ape, like these things of these different regions in the world where you're like, oh, it's just like a shorter version of a Sasquatch. It's probably BS. And then you read up on these things and it's like, oh, well. Something that looks just like this creature actually existed just a long time ago, you hmm. know? Yeah. And I'm thinking about that at the exact same time. I'm like, this this person on Tumblr is literally telling everyone I'm a fucking monster. <laughs> like, I'm a monster. I'm not a human. Like, and immediately your first reaction when you hear that is they're fucking lying. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. there's no way they can be telling the truth because we're all so skeptical about that. Like, what if we have programmed ourselves to identify potential threats as fiction? Like, even as a kid... I used to think to myself, like, if I was a creature and I wanted to hide, I would make a movie or write a book about me, exactly about me, so everyone would believe it was fake. You know what I mean? Like, what's really interesting about this whole thing is that as we begin to approach the Uncanny Valley in our media, we immediately pulled it back to make it more palatable. You know, we did it for dollar dollar bills, y'all, because we're losing money on these videos that we're putting out. But we legitimately approached this thing that made us uncomfortable. And like this weirdo on Tumblr said, or I'm sorry, this monster on Tumblr said, (laughs) like, we make things that are harsh realities more palatable immediately. And we absolutely did that. We we don't have depictions like that that trigger people anymore. But we are studying the Uncanny Valley to try and figure out exactly why it's happening and exactly what's causing it to happen. And if we can quantify, like, how far you can go to real and how far away from real you can go, that's something we're absolutely going to do as a society so we know where it lies and know where to avoid it. Which is probably good because there is a possibility, albeit a small one, that we currently have an experiment being run on us by some monster who has exposed themselves on Tumblr when people talked about what could possibly trigger a human being to feel uncomfortable when they see something that's not quite human. And they literally said me it would be me and things like me which do exist so uncanny valley is a very crazy topic and i hope i didn't lose anyone too far uh but it's definitely crazy and i hope you enjoyed it yeah it's terrifying thank yeah, you it is so uh yeah i knew this one was going to be a little bit weird and i appreciate the fact that you were very engaged in that one robin and asking a lot of questions because i went through so many fucking research articles where they're just quantifying the weirdest stuff and i'm like i can't include any of this like it's just so hard to talk about so it's like how do i break this down and make this just sound normal but it's just basically like you see something human that doesn't look quite human and it makes you really uncomfortable i just so i'm always going to go back to advent children but they just look so nice in that movie I just love how everybody looks in that movie. And maybe it's because they look more a little bit like anime characters than they do real people. It really makes Um, me want to go back through the things that I interpret as like, that's the most realistic like CGI thing I've seen. And then go back and look at it and be like, all right. You realize like, no, they really don't look that human. Yeah, they really don't look human. I'm going to go back and look at this stuff Because no one looks as perfect as Cloud. I hate you so much. Sephiroth is the coolest CGI character. Like, just Uh, seeing that announcement trailer for Super Smash Smash Brothers. I was oh like, god! When <laughs> I was like, I could cry. This thing is so amazing. I could but, cry right now. But during the trailer, when it, you think that he totally stabs Mario, and you're just like, Ugh! did he just kill Mario? Oh my god! But yeah, Man. so <laughs> uncanny valley, fun times. Um, but yeah. So I think that's just about everything we have for this episode. If you have a story you would like to send to us, we would absolutely love to hear it. It doesn't necessarily have to be about Uncanny Valley or about Chinese New Year. But if you have a story about anything like that, we absolutely want to hear it. So please email storytime at scarish.com or go to our website, scarish.com, and click on Contact Us. Fill out that form. It'll come directly to us. Or you can hit us up on any of our social medias. Facebook is facebook.com slash scarishpodcast. Twitter is at scarishpod. And Instagram is at scarishpodcast. Robin. For folks who would like to donate, how can they do that? You can go to patreon.com slash scaryishpodcast. Those are monthly donations. Tiers start at a dollar, and at a dollar, you get access to ad-free episodes, which is awesome. And um, there are physical merch tiers as well. Those start at $10. And um, right now, I'm still sending out Krampus keychains and magnets. Um, so if you want to get your hands on that, I will be sending out other 
the the next season's things in a couple months, so that'll be cool. Uh, but yeah, indeed. So that's uh, I think everything we got. So go ahead and sign us out. Keep on creeping on. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye bye.